I hope that everybody has their tattoo picked out because this is the last week that we're going to get to see those, so hopefully everyone knows what they're going to get after the series. But I'm excited to be here today as we wrap up this marked series. Over the past few weeks, we have been um, diving into the gospel of Mark to, to look at what it really means to be a follower of Jesus or to be a disciple. And from the very beginning, every disciple... Every follower of Jesus has had to respond to a call on their life. And our series verse reminds us of what that call sounds like. It says that Jesus called out to them, come follow me. Come follow me. It's just three little words, but it has so much power and has the potential to be life-changing for those that hear it. These are the first words that Jesus speaks to his disciples. And these are the same words that we hear in our lives today, to come follow Jesus. And maybe you remember that moment in your life when you first heard those words. Or maybe you're in a place right now where you're, you're starting to hear those words and you're trying to decide whether or not you're going you're gonna to accept the call or not. I remember when I first heard these words in my life. I, was, I grew up in the church, but there still came a moment for me when I realized just how real and how powerful Jesus was in my life. I was in middle school, and I heard these words, come follow me. And I knew in that moment that I wanted nothing more but to follow Jesus. But following Jesus is more than just a moment. Each and every day, Jesus calls us to come and follow once again. Following Jesus is a journey. Because once we hear that call, to come and follow. We're in this constant flux of choosing and examining and learning and serving and stretching ourselves to be the disciples that we're called to be. And the stories of Jesus and his disciples in the Gospel of Mark teach us valuable lessons and remind us of the reality of what it's like to follow Jesus. And in the midst of that, as we look at these stories, we have to be willing to examine our own lives and ask ourselves, Am I really following Jesus? Am I really following Jesus? And if you're like me, you probably want to believe that you're doing everything that you possibly can to follow Jesus to the best of your ability. But let me ask you some questions. When was the last time that you really examined your heart? When was the last time that you you took the, the, the pulse on your relationship with God? Was it thriving? Was it still beating? Or was it starting to die down? When you look at your habits and your motives and your desires, how do they line up with this claim that you've made to be a follower of Jesus? Is there evidence of Christ living in you? These are some tough questions to ask. And they're even harder for some of us to answer. But if we really want to follow Jesus and we want to be real and honest about it, then we have to be willing to examine our lives and ask the tough questions questions. Now, before we all get uncomfortable and wish that we had passed on church today, because we don't want to do this, and we don't want to examine, and we don't want to look, please take heart in knowing that we are all on this journey together, that we are all in desperate need of this examination, and not just us, but in the stories that we're going to read today in Mark, we're going to hear about some pretty prominent followers of Jesus who desperately needed to examine their our lives. So I just ask you in these next few minutes to just open your hearts, open your minds, open your ears to what it is that God might have to say to you and look at the ways in your life that you might need to grow and change. Now before we jump into the scripture, let me set the stage a little bit for you. Jesus and his disciples have been traveling together for some time now. They've been with him from, the disciples have been with him from the beginning and they have seen him do some pretty amazing things. They've seen him perform miracles. They've seen him heal people. Crowds are coming from all over just to be in his presence, just to hear him speak. And so the disciples, they know Jesus is kind of a big deal. And they are excited because they get to be on the forefront of this. They get to be some of the first people to join in on this movement. They know that Jesus is this Messiah that has been promised to them. And so they are loving being a part of his entourage. But in the midst of all the excitement surrounding Jesus, they start to get caught up in what that means for them. 
Let's start with James and John. James and John are some of the first disciples that Jesus called. And they leave their family, they leave their livelihoods, they leave everything to follow Jesus. And in, in chapter 10, which we're about to look at in a second, we get the impression that James and John kind of feel like they've got it figured out. Like they've been following Jesus for a while, they kind of know how things go, they feel like they're, they're doing really well, they've got a good handle on it. And so they come to Jesus with a request. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. He says, well, what do you want me to do for you? And they replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. Now, that's a pretty bold request. I mean, can you imagine if you got a new job and you were there for a few weeks and you're feeling pretty good about it? You think, okay, I'm doing this really well. Things are going smooth. I've got a pretty good handle on this. I think I'm ready for war. I think I, I, think I can do this. And so you go to your boss and you go up to your boss and you say, hey, I think that you should put me in, in charge of this whole department because I think I've got it. And your boss is probably going to look at you like you're a little bit crazy and send you back to your cubicle because that's not the plan. That's not where things are headed right now. And I think that's kind of what we see happening in this scripture is that James and John have these plans for themselves. They have these ideas of what they think should happen, but they don't ever stop to consider what Jesus' plans are. They want to follow Jesus on their terms. And we kind of get what that's like. We know what it's like to want to to claim some terms for our following Jesus. We know what it's like to want to negotiate our terms of discipleship. But the reality is that if we really want to follow Jesus, we have to let go of some of the control. Anybody here like to have control? Yeah, we love to have control. We, we live in a world where we love things to be about us and we like things to fit to our needs and our wants and our desires. We like to do things on our time and our, our pace. We love to have control. But we have to be able let go of some of that control and let go of some of that desire for power. And it's this desire for power and prestige that motivates James and John to make this request. Because in their time, in their culture, having power, having that prestige meant everything. It meant that you were someone important. It meant you were someone worth listening to, worth following. It could have changed everything for them. Imagine going from being a lowly fisherman to the right-hand man of God. It could have changed everything. But Jesus tells them that if they really want to be great, if they really want to have power in the kingdom of God, then they're, need to, they're going to need to humble themselves and serve others. And we live in a world today where we desire that power. We put all of our time and energy into to focusing on getting the power, getting the success, getting what we want and what we need. And we, we put all this into it. We put all of our time and effort into it. And at the end of the day, is there anything left over for us to serve others? Are we able to get off of our power trips long enough to humbly follow Jesus? Some of us need less power and more Jesus. But the disciples aren't the only ones who, who are in need of a moment of self-examination. And as we continue on in the Gospel of Mark, we read about a story about a young, rich man. And he comes to Jesus with a question. He, he wants to know, what does he have to do to inherit eternal life? And so he comes to Jesus and he asks him. And, and, he, and we learn from the text surrounding this story that this man was raised in a community that, that really taught the religious laws. They, they taught the laws. They taught the commandments. And so he has known these commandments and these rules from a young age. And he, and he tells Jesus that not only does he know them by heart, he knows them in and out, he has followed them every day of his life. And I can imagine he feels pretty proud of himself. He goes up to Jesus and gets to tell Jesus that he's done it all right. And so in this moment of examination, he thinks he's good. He thinks he's got it. And so he, pro he may even expect that Jesus is going to be like, no, don't worry about it. You're good. You don't need to do anything else. But that's not what happens. It says Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Jesus admires this man's earnestness, his willingness to, to get on board and to come and follow him. But he says, if you're going to do it, you're going to have to do some things first. And he 
challenges the man to examine his life again. And he asks him to put aside all that stuff that he has and put all of his trust in Jesus to truly follow him. And when the man looks at his life and he sees everything that he has, he becomes sad and he walks away from Jesus and he walks away from the invitation to follow him. And it's this challenge that Jesus offered him. It challenged him to to make room in his life, but his life was already filled with so much stuff. We have a lot of stuff in our life today. Maybe, you know, you have a really strong desire for some wealth and possessions, and it's that literal stuff in your life that gets in the way. But for others of us, there's so much that we need to get rid of. We need to be able to make room for Jesus in our lives. Maybe your schedule is a little bit too full. Or maybe your life is a little bit too comfortable sometimes. And it's hard to give that up. It's hard to get rid of those things and make that room when it causes things to be a little bit more uncomfortable or a little bit harder or just different. I know for me personally, lately I've really struggled with this idea that Jesus is kind of, it's kind of hard to follow Jesus. And I, I feel silly even saying it sometimes, but it, sometimes I just feel like it's hard. And it's because I love the ease and the comfort of my life sometimes. I don't want to have to push outside of that. I don't want to have to go beyond that. But I find that Jesus continues to do that. He keeps pushing me and, and challenging me beyond my comfort. But lately, there's also been this phrase that I've heard over and over again, is that God doesn't call us to easy And when I hear that phrase, I'm reminded to open my heart a little bit more, to make a little bit more room for Jesus in my life so that I can be a better disciple. So what is it in your life that you need to get rid of to make room for Jesus? Some of us need less stuff, less busyness, less comfort, and more Jesus. I want to take a look at another story, and this story jumps back to the disciples. And if you've been reading along in the Gospel of Mark with us over the past few weeks, you've probably caught on that the disciples need a lot of help sometimes. And so they have a lot of moments of self-examination. But in this story, Jesus and and his disciples have been traveling. And when they get to where they're going, Jesus says, what were you arguing about on the road? And they kept quiet because on the way they had argued about who was the greatest. And sitting down... Jesus called the twelve and said, If anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. And I love this story because by the t- between the point of having the argument and by the time they get to where they're going, the disciples have already realized how ridiculous their argument is. They've realized that there was really no good reason for them to be arguing about it. And they're embarrassed. They don't even want to tell Jesus what it is that they were talking about. They don't even want him to know. But Jesus has kind of already figured it out. He reminds them, if you want to be great, if you want to really be important, if you really want to do this, you have to make yourself less. You need to humble yourself so that you can be the servant of all. And they are just, they're trying to achieve this status, this greatness. And he says, that's not important. And in our own lives today, we we are always chasing after some kind of status. And we're always trying to put forth our best selves. We want everyone to see what we're good and great at and, and how awesome we are. And we hide all the other stuff because we want to be the best husband or wife or daughter or, or son or, or mother or father or whatever it is. We all want to be great at something. And so because we want to be great at it, we put so much time and energy, and we focus all on ourselves and, and getting that that confirmation in ourselves that we forget about those around us. And we stop seeing that we need to be a little bit more humble and that we need to love others. Jesus doesn't care about your status. Jesus doesn't care how perfect your life is. He wants you to serve others. He wants you to follow him. And so some of us need to focus less on trying to achieve a status or an ideal and focus more on Jesus and serving others. This t- taking this time for examination and questioning in our life can be really hard. It can be challenging. It can be uncomfortable. 
Because when we start to do it, we start to realize that some of our habits and some of our motives and, and some of our desires don't reveal things that are very good. We start to realize that maybe we've strayed or that maybe we have some things that we really need to work on. But it's this examination that I think is so important and so necessary as followers of Jesus. If we want to grow, we have to be willing to examine. I want to look at one more story with you today. And this story is the story of Peter's examination. It says, Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. So in this moment, Jesus has just revealed to them, to his disciples and to those around him, that truth about what is going to happen to him, how life is going to go from here on out. He tells them that he's going to be rejected. He's going to be persecuted, and he's going to be killed. When Peter hears this, he can't, believe his, he can't believe that Jesus is saying this. And he's so offended by this, so ter- put off by this, that he goes to Jesus and says, no, this is not what's going to happen. This can't happen. You're Jesus. This isn't how things are going to go. And the story continues with that when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of man. Get behind me, Satan. Can you imagine how Peter must have felt in that moment to be equated with the one who who breaks apart the kingdom of God, who destroys the kingdom of God? He probably felt awful, but he was so distracted by his expectations and his hopes for Jesus and what this life would be like that he wasn't able to see the redemption of God's love and grace that God was going to have in store for the world through Jesus' death and resurrection. He was so focused on the things of man that he wasn't able to see beyond to the things of God. In the Methodist church, in order to become a pastor, you have to go through a very long process of examination and evaluation. And this is a process that I'm in right now, and there, there are lots of committees and paperwork, and you have to get some psych evaluations, and then there's some more committees, and it goes on for years. It's a very long process. And in the midst of it, um, you're really forced to look at your life. You're forced to look at your motives. You're forced to look at why it is that you're doing this. You're forced to look at your relationship with God and figure out, you know, what's really going on and if you're really on the right track. And sometimes as I go through this process, I, I think, oh, I'm doing pretty good. I've got this. You know, things are going great. But more often than not, I realize I really have stuff that I need to work on. I really have areas that I need to desperately grow in. But even though this examination can be hard sometimes and challenging and frustrating, we do it because we want to be the best, most well-equipped, grace-filled pastors that we can possibly be before we ever step into a church. We do it because we want to better the kingdom of God and serve the kingdom of God to the best of our abilities. And I don't think that this examination that we go through should just be limited to pastors. I think we all should be looking at our lives and trying to figure out how can we better serve the kingdom of God? How can I grow? How can I be better? How can I move forward? Because when we don't take the time to examine our lives, it can be a very dangerous thing. Peter was so caught up in the world And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. We don't want to be on the receiving end of that kind of thing. If we don't examine our lives, we don't take that time to focus on Jesus and focus on what Jesus wants. Instead, we focus on what the world wants. We are distracting others from the love and grace of God. They're not able to see it. And when we choose to to follow the ways and the standards of this world instead of following the ways and the standards that have been set before us as disciples we start to confuse people about what jesus and god is even all about we claim to be followers of jesus but we act a completely different way that's not going to make sense and when we claim to be a christian and we don't put god first and we don't put our relationship first, and we don't try to grow in that relationship, Jesus' presence in the world diminishes. 
We're called to be disciples. We're called to be that light in the world. And if we're not being that light, how is it going to be seen? But on the other hand, when we choose to follow Jesus, and we accept that call to come and follow, we are also accepting the call to say, hey, I'm willing and able to look at my life closely. I'm willing and able to make some changes, and I'm willing and able to repent when I mess up. But I'm going to do it. I'm going to look at my life. I'm going to follow you better. And when we do that, when we take that time to examine our lives, it frees us up to be able to share the love and grace of Jesus better. That stuff that's laying on our shoulders, the weight of the world is gone. We can just focus on that, and it frees us up to share that with others. When we live by God's standards, instead of focusing on the standards of this world, then we empower others to see what this kind of life can be like. We empower them to want to live for something bigger and better than what they're living now. And when we live a life that is examined, and we claim the name Jesus, and we show people who we are, then Jesus' love in the world multiplies and spreads. And that's something that we are called to be a part of. We are the vessels for which that can happen. When we examine our lives, we see where we're at. But we're also able to see where we need to go next. We see where we need to grow and where we need to change and where we are able to continue on this journey of following Jesus. And when we do that, great things can happen. Lives can be changed. People can be moved. Things can happen. It's like the song said, beautiful things. God can make beautiful things out of what we can do if we take the time to examine our lives and be honest about where we're at. So this week, I just challenge you. Look at your life. Examine your heart and see if there's just maybe one area that you think, I need to grow. I need to change so that I can be a better disciple. And just ask yourselves, are you following after the things of man or are you following after the things of God? I want, I'm going to ask the band to come back up for us as we finish up. And I just want to direct your attention to your connection card to your next steps. And there's one that I want you to take a look at. It says that if, if I'm honest, I need to focus more on Jesus and less on blank. What is it for you? What in your life do you need to maybe make a little bit smaller so that Jesus can become a little bit bigger 